Welcome to the Tateuchi Democracy Center of the Japanese American National Museum. I'm John Asaki, Vice President of Programs here at the museum. In my work here at JANUM, um, I've been here on staff for 18 years now, and I'm continually reminded of the importance of that uh, commission on wartime relocation and internment of civilians that happened in 1981. It's frequently referenced in programs and exhibitions. And in fact, uh, you know, this past year we had an exhibition commemorating the 75th year since President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. And we had an exhibition that um, we borrowed from the National Archives, the document that Roosevelt signed that ordered uh, Japanese Americans to the concentration camps in 1942. And a um, integral part of that exhibition was the commission hearings in our theater. And the, the curator, Clement Hanami, really was adamant about including that because the testimonies from that event were so dramatic and so um, uh, just really uh, the first time our community really opened up in public about the camp experience. So we had clips from the commission hearings and uh, I set of photographs, and I think our visitors, uh, many of whom were, were new to the subject, really got a lot out of watching those testimonies, seeing the drama, and um, realizing some of the uh, details of people's lives who were affected by that uh, executive order. Um, before I um, worked, started working here at Janum, I worked at Visual Communications for almost 20 years. And um, so I have a real personal connection also to the commission hearings in that as a film student in 1981, I had been volunteering at VC and um, I worked with one of our panelists here today, Dwayne Kubo, who was uh, at the time uh, of the commission hearings was organizing this um, uh, videotape documentation of the event. So he was enlisting all of us on the staff and volunteers to participate because the hearings were around the clock for three days and, you know, uh, we, do, we were dividing up the coverage into a couple of hours each manning the camera. So that was, I was able to attend the hearings as a videographer and watch some of the proceedings. So it was a profoundly uh, educational and emotionally moving experience for me at that time. So I really kind of got a start at VC and the whole, um, area of Asian American, Japanese American media by participating in that really um, monumental event for our community. And then later, um, it was probably over a decade later, um, working with NCRR and the Education Committee, VC took those tapes and um, restored them by transferring them to a new digital format at the time, digital beta cam, to try to preserve those stories. So I was fortunate to get involved with that project also, which was um, funded by the um, uh, Civil Liberties Public Education Grant Program. And that was an opportunity, once again, to review all the testimonies from uh, three days here in downtown Los Angeles. And the committee um, went over and wrote summaries of all the testimonies and rewatched all that um, uh, testimony. So once again, that was really uh, 
just so impactful to review that material later. And some of the people who had testified had passed on at that point. So um, again, I feel fortunate that that seminal event in our community is kind of woven through the work that I've been able to do for both visual communications and um, for the museum. Um, so now, this program kind of launches us into a new chapter of uh, renewed interest again in the commission hearings during our troubled times. And uh, because it's now on a DVD, it will be accessible to many more audiences and new audiences. So that makes me very pleased and hopeful that this content will continue to impact people for generations to come. So to, for today's program, we're very fortunate to have Naomi Hirahara as our guest moderator. Um, she is a rare talent in that she documents our community and also writes creatively as a novelist. So she creatively interprets the Japanese American experience as well. And I remember her roots in the community really go deep because you know, she was formerly editor of our community newspaper, the Rafu Shimpo, and I would see her at almost every event uh, covering stories, and so she has really an unequaled knowledge of, of um, our community's issues. Um, she also uh, is acclaimed internationally as a mystery novelist, and um, upcoming, uh, she, she has a release coming up in March of, I believe it's the final Mas Arai mystery novel. I, I can't believe it's the final one, <laughs> really? Um, anyway, so that, we'll have an event here in March. Uh, March, what, March? March 17th, Naomi will be reading and presenting about her new book called Hiroshima Boy. And uh, you'll have a chance to talk with Naomi and get your book signed by her. She also, um, in April, Heyday Books will be publishing Life After Manzanar, which she co-wrote with Heather Lindquist. Heather Lindquist. And um, that book includes a section on the commission hearings. And finally, uh, she's branching out into filmmaking also. Is, um, she's been working with filmmaker Derek Shimoda on a fictional uh, feature film adaptation of her book, Bachi Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Summer of the Big Bachi. Why did I say that? I, I, I locked up there. Summer of the Big Bachi. Sorry, Naomi. <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're so uh, fortunate to have her here today to guide us through these proceedings. So please give a warm welcome for Naomi Hirohara. It's a great honor to be here today. I just wanted to explain briefly the whole format. Um, first, we'll have um, an artistic monologue. From there, um, there will be clips from the commission hearings, as well as clips from three of the panelists that testified. So you'll be able to see that. We will then go into a, a brief panel discussion. And most importantly, you will get a chance to ask your questions of our panelists. So it's going to be a really great program. Um, so this, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our first presenter and actor, Julie Lee. And she'll be bef performing a Sansei monologue written by Mia Iwataki. This is an excerpt from the Pool Project's Tales of Clamor, produced by aerial artist and actor Kennedy Cabaceras and writer-actor Tracy Katokiriyama. 
Tales of Clamor is a theatrical case study working in collaboration with NCRR. It's just an amazing work. Its political texture calls on us to recognize the need for perpetual solidarity and the power of a community breaking silence in order to create cathartic change. Performers also involved in this current workshops stage of Tales of Clamor, and some of them are in the audience, are Takayo Fisher, Kurt Kuniyoshi, Julie, Jeannie Sakata, and Greg Watanabe. So now, the monologue. Spring, 1981, Los Angeles. Uh, hey, Mom. Um, I really want you to think about testifying at the commission hearings about camp. Okay, please just listen, okay? Um, growing up, I know you tried to spare us from hearing about the racism you had to go through, so you never talked about camp. But I saw how you would turn the other cheek and how you would defer to white people. And I never told you this, but it made me angry and ashamed. And back in the 60s, black parents and grandparents, children of slaves, were fighting for civil rights. They had Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, the Black Panther Party. I saw the Brown Berets reclaiming their history and fighting for La Raza. But who did we have? Where were you? Why didn't you fight back? I mean, why didn't you even tell us about camp? I could never figure out the silence, what was behind that silence. And it wasn't just me. A lot of other sanseis couldn't figure it out either. So we got together, and we talked, and I learned a lot about the conditions that existed in this country that made the camps even possible, the uh, disgusting racism you had to face, the corrupt politicians, the legal system that shut you out, and no one spoke up for you. But mom, now we have this opportunity. Okay, look, when I first heard that they were going to have the presidential commission to determine whether or not the camps were justified, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, how could anyone with half a brain not see that it was a total injustice? And then they wanted to hold the hearings all the way out in Washington, D.C., with, with scholars and legislators and other muckety mucks and people who had no idea, no, no concept of what the camps were like. But mom, we fought and got them to come here to Los Angeles so they can hear about the camps from you from the people who actually lived through it. And now we need you to testify and tell them what this country did to you. Mom, we need to make sure that this travesty is documented in government records and taught in our schools so that it never happens again. You know what? Okay. Friends from the black and Latino communities are ready to march with us. Our Native American sisters and brothers are ready to stand with us. But how can we ask them to come out and support us if you won't even speak? Mom, I, I, I know it's hard. I mean, you've kept this silence for 35 years. But you need to tell your story, testify. Only you can set the record straight. Testify. This is your time. Please, speak out. OK, thank you, Mom. It's unembellished, it's straightforward, and it's a devastating indictment of our government 
and of our society. When the photographs of camp were shown at the Pasadena Art Museum some years ago, I burst into tears and could not stop the tears from flowing. All the pent-up emotion held back for so many years was released. The numbness of the evacuation was finally lifted, and because of the humiliation and shame, I could never tell my four children my true feelings about that event in 1942. I did not want my children to feel the burden of shame and feeling of rejection by their fellow Americans. I feel that this hearing has, has been long overdue, for I equate the uh, evacuation with rape. Uh, a rape victim finds it very difficult to uh, talk about it and suffers from shock. And uh, I think that we have been through that period where it has been difficult to talk about. I have never been able to talk about this. More people have come up to me and said, I, sh I must become. My, my children, even my own children, don't know that my brother was shot in the back. When on December 7, 1941, 11 p.m., the FBI entered our home and arrested him and gave no reason. I asked him, when will he return? The FBI agent as replied, you may never see him again. In 48 hours, we were told to pack up and leave from the place we call home for at least 50 years or more. Two guys walk in my house, and they came to my bedroom, and they say, hey, hey, buddy, wake up. I, do, I wake up, and I ask them, who the hell you guys are? <laughs> then they flash, FBI, you say, FBI. So I go, what the hell did I do? You are alien, enemy alien. I, on the train, we first time I had a steak. So you know what some of these old men said? The old men said, hey, they feeding us because we're going to Die. So I said, no, 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 this country ain't gonna do that kind of stuff, man. You know, it's a democratic country, bureau right, constitutional, and they all like that. Just go with it, see? So they're not gonna do that. This is democracy. You know what one woman say? No, this is not democracy. This is democracy, shit, you see? <laughs> then we reached the place where we see nothing but the snow. We call it the Bismarck, North Dakota. Now, I found out the weather was a 30 below zero. A 30 below zero. Now, I had to walk through the snow with my bare foot and slippers. And the third day, I had a frostbite on my feet. I couldn't go. So that I asked my friends to bring food to my camp. When we got to Santa Anita, we were assigned housing in the stables. Where one horse was housed, there we were three families. They came to say goodbye to me before being moved to Machi. Colorado, and I waved goodbye to my sister from the window. I did not know then that it would be four and a half years before I would see any of them again. Not see my father again until the middle of 1946. This inhumane, cruel treatment and happening took place in the good old United States and not in Gestapo, Germany. Hard to believe, isn't it? On August 27, 1940. One at 2 a.m., we were informed that our baby had passed away. Incarcerated in a hot, dusty hellhole took tremendous adjustment, and the word gamang is most appropriate. One day in Parker, I, like other young people, wanted to go into a store for an ice cream soda, only to be told that I could not be served. For the first time, I felt racial discrimination, a reality. At the time of my birth, my mother's physician in camp performed a tubal ligation on her. She never, never gave her consent. As a Buddhist at that time, my conscientious objector status was not recognized nor respected, but completely ignored. Shortly thereafter, would you believe it, I was placed on the deportation list by the Justice Department. Are you willing to serve for the United States in case of an enemy invaded us? And he said yes or no. And another one like, are you willing to be a lawyer to the United States? And yes or no, and uh, etc. I wrote no all the way through with my anger and dis disgust and frustration. The brutal action taken against us loyal citizens. My blood was burning with agony and frustration. I was so disgusted that I request for deportation to Japan, a country I had never seen before. 
Then I was sent to Tula Lake. My feelings on this matter were just as strong as and in full agreement with those who chose to renounce their citizenship, even though the renunciants and I took paths that were poles apart. We were the only Japanese American family on Kodiak, uh, in Kodiak, Alaska. In a short time, my father and two uncles were arrested and put in concentration camps. I am very bitter about this. I have not seen my father since I was 11 years old. I am now 51 years old. I have missed my father very much. And I wonder. I, I wonder if he's alive today. <coughs> As, as for now, all I can do States at the time. Now I understand that in fact uh, 5,000 Japanese Peruvians were uh, exchanged for American prisoners of war now. In this process, in this uh, transport, transportation process, uh, the baby died. So we stayed in Crystal City until uh, summer, of 1940, summer of 1947. I remember as a child when I used to stay, uh, when, we, when we used to stay at Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America. I, I, never felt, I never felt comfortable by staying it. I couldn't understand why. I think today now I understand why it was that I could not say those words comfortably. The pain, trauma, and stress of the incarceration experience was so overwhelming we use the psychological defense mechanisms of repression, denial, and rationalization to keep us from facing the truth. The truth was that the government we trusted, the country we love, the nation to which we had pledged loyalty, had betrayed us, had turned against us. Our natural human feelings of rage, fear, and helplessness were turned inward and buried. Our scars are permanent and deep. One significant consequence was the effectively silencing of an entire Japanese American community to become the Gomen Asai people, those who tread lightly as if unwelcome. As one student stated in her term paper, the shame and humiliation that my parents suffered were passed on to me. And although I never saw Bob Wire, tasted mess hall food, or lived in cramped barracks, my mind is still in prison from that experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Listen, I'm sorry. If we have outbursts like this, we're going to ask people to be removed. We know how some people are. Now, wait a second. Uh, some...
what are the uh, economic losses? The $68 billion, although it sounds astonishing, is a minimal figure because we are dealing only with what the government allowed in 1948, okay, which as you know was virtually nothing. It was nothing for psychological damages, physical damages, anything that could be connected with, with the evacuation, uh, wrongful death, wrongful incarceration. Frustration, anger, still in my blood. I now demand a monetary compensation of $1 million from the United States government. for ruining my life, career, and injury inflicted upon me and my family. I also demand a monetary compensation of half a million dollars each to my five children. No one benefits when truth is silent. The bigots and uninformed demagogues and persecutors will become increasingly suppressive and abusive, Attem attempting to diminish our characters through crude jokes and half-truth I will be proud to be a Japanese, and I would want to be equally proud to be an American. I do hope my late father's ideals and expectations for this country will someday be realized. The redress we are seeking cannot return to us the years of unjustified imprisonment, emotional, mental, and physical hardships we endured or any treasured possessions we were forced to sell or were stolen from us. Those in positions of power today who will be deciding the fate of this issue not only finalize it for us, but for every citizen, present and future, who could be subjected to collective punishment because of his race, creed, or national origin. The final judgment will affect all Americans, now and for all time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for all those that who suffered this humility and the loss of freedom, I ask the Commission to search their souls, to be compassionate. It is an opportunity for us to continue to learn and to sum up this collective experience and to channel the anger and pain into a fighting spirit that demands reparations. Thank you. And most importantly, we strongly call for direct monetary compensation to each victim of the concentration camps. This is a historic and significant event. Any compromised recommendation will be a compromise of justice. Thank you. They talk about being let out of camp in 45, 44, 43. I don't think we ever did get out of camp. I think we're beginning to get out of camp now. We cannot forget because this experience is too much a part of us. We cannot forget because this is too deeply embedded in our psyches. It is part of our legacy. Perhaps we can explain our situation by comparing our experience with that of a rape victim. A victim of rape is traumatized by the experience. Most rape victims find it extremely difficult to talk about it. We felt we were raped by our own country, raped of our freedom, raped of our human dignity, raped of our civil liberties. We felt that somehow we were party to this act of defilement, that we had somehow helped to bring it on. We innocent victims felt guilt and shame about it all. And if you know anything about Japanese culture, you will know that guilt and shame has strong influences upon us. At long last, after 39 years, we feel a little more comfortable talking about this experience that happened to us. We have come to the realization that the camp experience had a very negative psychological effect upon us. It has profoundly affected our sense of ethnic identity, and thereby our sense of self-worth. One internee said, I felt terribly ashamed and guilty about being Japanese. Think of the self-hatred this kind of mentality fosters in people. Our self-esteem, our self-regard was shattered. 
We did not feel comfortable talking about our camp experience with others. We scarcely talked about it with our own children. Our children forced us to talk about camps. They pulled it out of us. We did not talk about camp easily or naturally. It brought great discomfort to us. We remember the lessons we were taught in school about democracy, about our constitution, about our legal rights. If you are injured, harmed, falsely imprisoned, had your character defamed, been denied your civil rights, then you seek redress, you seek restitution. And that's why we have come to this place. And so we are here. As long as we have not received personal redress, our reputations are tainted. And unfortunately, many Americans still believe we were disloyal and that the government was justified in its action. The start of the war seemed to produce a sort of a hysteria. I remember seeing 50 FBI agents scouring the Japanese neighborhood. They came to see my father, perhaps to take him away. But he was lucky. He was downtown selling his tomatoes to his Italian and Slavonian customers. So they passed them up and he wasn't taken immediately like the others in San Pedro and Terminal Island. Shortly after Pearl Harbor, my brother violated the military order. When they found out that he was Japanese, they took him to jail in San Pedro. And in the jail, he was shocked to see so many Japanese Issei's who were, who were neighbors and friends who were being held there for no reason at all. He was released from the jail the day of our evacuation. My father started to scold him for being in jail. But my brother pointed out that other Japanese were being held there and asked what crime did they commit. My father could not find the answer for him. I just began to realize my first lesson in prejudice. We were only allowed to take with us just what we could carry. We left the crops that were about to be harvested in the field. Also left 29 years of our lives in our house. We try to sell our things for whatever we can get. In the confusion, many people simply walked off with our things. What was left behind, we stored with a longtime friend, assuring us it was safekeeping. Three and a half years later, we asked them to return our things back to us, but our friend said it was stolen. We spent a total of six months in Santa Anita Hardly anything was ready for us when we arrived there. We slept in a stable only recently vacated by horses. The first day we were given a sack to fill with straws for our mattress. The smell of the animals never seemed to leave us. I soon developed a bad case of asthma as I was allergic to Kentucky bluegrass. Without any knowledge to my parents, Quietly, they took them under guards to Poston, Arizona. This all happened in 1942. In October, we were then sent to Santa Anita. No, in October, we were then sent from Santa Anita to Jerome, Arkansas. We did not see my brother until 1945 when he stopped by to see us on the way to Germany. He was inducted in the Army. After the war, I came back to California after working in Chicago with a one-way ticket and little money. I had a hard time finding housing. The War Relocation Center authorized, no, the War Relocation Authority referred me to government housing in which I lived in Truman Boyd Manor for 15 years. I am very disappointed in my government for I did nothing wrong to be in a concentration camp. I developed a tremendous guilt, <coughs> feeling like I had started a war or something. People made me feel like I had leprosy. I still have bad memories of San Pedro that I don't want to go back to. Being from a close-knit family, my brother doesn't want to come back to California even after all these years. My parents lost everything. The memory of the evacuation still exists in my mind. 
I cannot keep from crying sometimes, thinking what had happened to my parents, sister, brother, and me. Now you can understand why I hope I never have to see any other or any any anyone or any other race in America treated like we were and put in a concentration camp again. And I will not be heard by you as a representative of this government. Yeah. I was seven years old when we had a Christmas party. And I remember they provided us with toys from the outside. And I got this old repainted toy. And the adult who gave it to me was rather embarrassed because the toy was clearly broken. So they passed out this stuff and I took it and I could see that he felt very bad. And I can understand these feelings because I have a child of my own. The last thing I'd want to give him is a broken toy. When I took that toy and I threw it in the trash can later on, I looked at it and I threw it away, right on the spot. And to me, that toy symbolizes how we as a minority are treated in this country. Second class, broken, all the promises are broken. And I would just like to say this. There will never be a 442 again. And I'll tell you why. The Nisei were incredibly loyal to the United States. I mean, time after time, you hear the older Nisei say, I can't believe they did this to me. In many cases, their, their hearts were full of love for this country. They gave it their all. If you try to have an all-minority army now, I'd say this country better watch out. Because that minority army may be watch, marching on Washington instead of Peking or Moscow. We will not be second-class citizens ever again. Now, you wonder what I am. I'm one of the younger Niseis, and I am a product of the camps. And what you're looking at, in many ways, is sort of a living cancer cell. And I'm going to multiply and really make this country sick in many ways. And the only cure for something like me is to really show me that you have a country that can live up to some of its promises. The people I want to thank in this community are the common people, such as the Nisei domestic, the clerk, and the gardener. And you know why they are, why they are the true heroes? Because they kept us from starving while our own country turned its back on us. They worked hard and they never got any recognition. If it wasn't for them, we would not have found them. What a treasure, right? I mean, just to see it on the big screen like that. I mean, we need more representation, right? To see. Asian Americans and Japanese Americans really telling our story. So it's my pleasure right now. Um, may I have the panelists come forward? And as they um, take their seats, um, I just wanted to just share for myself, I was only 19 years old when um, the commission hearings uh, took place. Um, I was actually out of the country, but I remember when I went back to uh, school, I went to Stanford, and um, the activists on our campus, Hope Nakamura and Woody Ichiyasu, they were talking about going to the commission hearings in San Francisco. And I don't think I really truly understood how important it was, the magnitude of it. But I think that's why it's so important that Visual Communications and NCRR had actually documented this for us. So later we could see it, you know, um, it's like what been 35 years, 34 years. Um, no, wait, how many years is it? 36. And um, it, it's, it, I still get chills like watching this. So, um, and three of these individuals um, actually testified and two of them um, really helped behind the scenes. So I'm gonna be introducing them. First we have Dwayne Kubo, 
And um, Duane was one of the co-founders of Visual Communications, along with um, three others, um, including um, uh, Eddie Wong and uh, Alan Ohashi, and of course, our own uh, Robert Nakamura. Um, Duane um, recently retired from De Anza College, and he was the Dean of Intercultural and International Studies, and he taught Asian American Studies there. And um, he um, had moved from LA to San Jose, uh, like a couple years, you know, within a couple years of, of the commission hearings. And now he just hangs out in San, San Jose, Japantown, which is a great place to hang out. I love it. And he's created J-Town Community TV. Um, it's a YouTube channel, so check it out. We all can go on our computers and look at it. And he has started the Silicon Valley Asian American Film Fest. Um, next to him, we have Jim Matsoka, and you all um, recognize him from the last footage there. And um, he's the founding member of NCRR. Yes, one, let's give him a hand. You all are our stars. Um, and um, he and Bert Nakano, um, the late Bert Nakano, was a national spokesperson for NCRR. And those two are given the task of recruiting people to testify. Um, he retired from Cal State Long Beach. He was the associate director of the EOP um, department. Next to him is Harry Kawahara. Um, a retired faculty member of Pasadena City College. Yay, Pasadena. I have to <laughs> give props to my <laughs> hometown. And he was instrumental in starting Asian American Studies at PCC. He was co-chair of the Redress Committee for JCL, Pacific Southwest District, during the hearings. And um, he also helped to prepare witnesses who testified before the commission. Next to him, we have another star from the footage we just saw. Evelyn, what did you say? What were you shouting? <laughs> With Lin Lillian Baker. Get her out of here. Oh, get her out of oh, here, no. okay. <laughs> and um, Evelyn was uh, active in the outreach committee of NCRR when it stood for National Coalition for Redress and Reparations. And um, from its founding in 1980 through its passage of redress, uh, the Redress Bill in 1987 and um, now she's uh, working for, um, she's, work, she's been dedicating her life for the community control of Little Tokyo for the more than 30 years and uh, mostly through her work uh, with the Little Tokyo Service Center and um, she, her husband is here, Bruce Iwasaki and she has a cool daughter and <laughs> Naomi. Um, so, and uh, 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 adorable grandson, Genzo. Okay, and last but not least, we have um, Sumi Seki. And Sumi was born on November 24th, um, in uh, 1924 in White Point, San Pedro. So you recently had a birthday, Sumi, <laughs> right? Birthday, <huh>? No? <laughs> uh, and, and I believe she's 90 years old. Are you 90? 90? No? She's still 16. Oh, she's still 16. OK. <laughs> I, I am too. OK. And um, you heard a lot of her story um, from her testimony, so I won't go over it right now. But um, she, uh, she, she's been uh, represented uh, at NCRR at press conference, and she's volunteered. I believe her husband here, um, Don Secchi, who's been very active with the vets. Um, um, and the 442nd Go For Broke organization. So thank you so much for being here. Um, so first, Duane, um, I wanted you to speak because, you know, there's not this kind of documentation of the other commission hearings in San Francisco and Chicago and other Seattle. So why, why do we have such a treasure here? I mean, what were the things that um, came together to produce um, this kind of footage of the hearings? Well, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I think the uh, short answer is that because we have VC, Visual Communications in LA, by the time of the uh, commission hearings, VC had been around for about 12 years. 
And uh, we had done numerous community-based documentaries, as well as by that time, we had done Hitohata Raise the Banner, the feature-length film that we produced. But I think you need to put VC in the context of, at least for me, the legacy that was created by Ghidra and other community-based media, because many of us came out of the Ghidra tradition. And, um, what is, can you tell people? Who Ghidra was the first Asian-American national uh, publication that really addressed uh, the concerns and the expressions of Asian Americans through this country. And it's really instrumental in developing the identity of being Asian American in this country. And so myself, Bob, Eddie, I think we all uh, worked at one time or another on Gijra, and I think we came out of that tradition. So I would put that um, beginning here in LA as really the reason why we were really ready to uh, document uh, the commission hearings, that was kind of a natural. And what I found interesting from the footage, I recognized people like in the audience. I think there was Wakako Yamauchi and you know all these faces. Frank Chen was there, I think. But um, so how logistically, how did you organize it? Um, how many, you know? So it was um, a production that was done in typical VC fashion. That is, we went out and begged and borrowed equipment. Uh, by that time, well, we knew that it was going to be many, many hours of testimony. So um, we didn't have, um, let's say, uh, we didn't have VHS equipment that enabled us to um, video record for two hours at a time. So we had to actually borrow that equipment. Uh, we had to ask for volunteers, um, put a call out to see who would want to um, actually work on this. And I distinctly remember writing a proposal to NCRR, to Jim, actually, for $400 to try to fund the raw videotape stock that we used to document the entire commission hearings. We didn't even have the $400 that would cover that. So, But again, I think it's really uh, in the tradition of community-based media that all of this was done. And, and I just want to, I have a few things that I wanted to say regarding that. Uh, one, many of you know that uh, we don't have many credits on early VC productions. And I just wanted to point out that there were uh, a number of people that worked on this, including uh, John Asaki, who introduced this program today. He went on to uh, become part of the media arts group here at the museum and is now VP of programs. Uh, Alan Kondo was on, on the crew. Um, he later worked with NCRR on the um, Justice Now, Reparations Now video and uh, continued on with visual communications as well. Janice Tanaka worked on the program. She's done many documentaries for this museum and continues as a filmmaker today. Art Nomura, who uh, actually loaned us a lot of the equipment that we used to shoot this. Takashi Fuji. And of course, we had Bob Nakamura, the founder of VC, shooting still photographs during the commission hearings. And I also want to add that uh, another one of VC's founders, Eddie Wong, did document the San Francisco Commission hearings, although we're still looking for that. So <laughs> I, I really have to commend NCRR VC yeah. to, in um, retaining this material. You can see how valuable and how moving it is. And the fact that it still amazes me today that um, the, these, I, I think these are still maybe the only, uh, the only documentation of the commission hearings that exist throughout the country. And so that's just amazing to me. Yeah, and you know, like everyone has a camera now, you know, on their phone, but it's like, how is that being preserved? You know, it's one thing to shoot things, but how do you keep it for posterity? So that's an important that's issue. That's why we have J-Town Community TV. <laughs> okay, you so. could talk about it later. <laughs> I, I just wanted okay. to add one other thing, and that is that um, we as uh, individuals are also part of NCRR, so it wasn't like we were coming in to shoot these uh, as a third party. We were part of the planning of it, and we knew that we would be uh, videotaping the commission hearings. Definitely. So um, Jim, what I wanted to ask you is, well, can you give us kind of a larger context? Because when they were first discussing the commission hearings, not everyone felt it would be a necessarily good thing. There was some skepticism, like what was the government, would the government um, really uh, listen to what people had to say? So um, just your thoughts of how were you and Bert able to convince people to actually testify? And can you 
kind of go through that. And, and I think it was, you didn't get too many volunteers. It was like three weeks into it and not too many people had volunteered. But how did you go about it? Well, trying to get Nisei to uh, speak in public and uh, do all these things is very difficult. It's like pulling teeth. And I think with about uh, three weeks to go, I asked Bert, I said, uh, how many people do you think we have? He says, as far as I know, we, we only have about eight. So I, I was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's going to be a public relations disaster if it's sort of like we give a party and nobody shows up. So uh, we had a meeting that evening, our general meeting, and uh, people asked me, well, how many people do we have? And I said, I don't think we have too many. And I, and I, I said, you know what? I think everybody in this room, there was about 12 of us, are going to have to uh, volunteer to testify. So right then and there, if you do the math, that's 12 times 8. So they gave us at least 20 on the spot there. And toward the final week, all of a sudden, it was sort of like a, um, a uh, wall of ice cracking open all of a sudden. Uh, all, we looked around, and people were, were coming through the door, in a sense. that. And then we had to get on the phone and ask people to come down to help us, to help people fill out the, fill out the forms and write all, all of this. And, uh, and I think a, a total of about 150 people wound up uh, overall testifying over, over the three days. And we also scheduled a night meeting at the Little Tokyo Towers. So it was like the wall of silence of uh, the Japanese Americans was breaking finally, and people wanted to say things about what happened to them. I'd like to say one thing before. Um, anyway, we were at this meeting in Gardena, and it, it really got hot. That lady, Lillian Baker, was there. Oh. I swear that that woman was a was always around. She was the one yanking the paper away from uh, Jim Cohen. Kawa one Manami of the 442nd. And the Nisei at this meeting, were, oh, we, we, we had to separate the two because they, they were going to go at each other. And Lillian stands up in the middle of it all and she says very emotionally, she says, my husband went to the Pacific and never came back. And I couldn't help myself. I said, if I was your husband, I wouldn't come back either. <laughs> I, I recall when I was at the newspaper, Lillian Baker was still alive and writing into the Rough Shimpo regularly. Um, Sumi, I, I believe when you test, you were there when um, Lillian Baker took the paper. Can you just? Um, do you have any remembrance of that moment? All I remember was that she yeah. she stood up and grabs. I think the lady that was testifying, she grabbed her paper, and she made an uproar, and they had to um, escort her out of the um, hearing. There, I remember her, but that's about all. And I was so scared when I would had to testify. I'll never do that again. <laughs> I'll never testify again. So did you practice? You had written something. Did you practice it before you testified? When I testified? Yeah. Oh, that was so scary. <laughs> I'll never do it again. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, here, you could have it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was so moving with your testimony because you talked about your brother who had been arrested, and you oh, talked. Oh yeah, my brother always was a rascal anyway, but the um, we were only confined to five miles away from home, but he didn't uh, abide by that. He was at 15 miles away, and they put him in jail until we evacuated uh, August, I mean, April the 4th, 1942, they released him to go to Santa Anita. We went to Santa Anita, 
and he wouldn't stay in Santa Anita's. He jumped the fence and he went to the movie. He got caught and they sent him to another camp in Arizona and they never notified us where he was or where he had sent him. So we really don't know where he was until one of our San Pedro friends who was in Poston wrote to my father telling us that he saw Massa being escorted by the police into the mess hall from another camp into Poston. And they marched him back into the prison again. And then it was until after induction to the army that we saw him again. But until then, we didn't know exactly where he was. But um, to us, I think evacuation was a terrible memory for, for us from the very beginning to the last, I think it was. But I don't know, I was a teenager and I was a rascal in those days, so. Kind of runs in the family, yeah. huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, maybe, um, Harry, you could help us to like set the scene because there were nine commissioners. They're mostly white men. Um, there was one, only one um, Japanese American commissioner, Judge Maritani. So how was it for people to, to go into that room and testify? Um, can you just tell us how, how it felt to walk into that room and what, what was the mood? Is, it, is this on? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Let me just say quickly, I'm happy to sit next to Jim Matsuoka here. I was lessons from him about how to get the attention of people by banging them at the table. <laughs> they really work very well, I must admit. I was the uh, co-chair of the uh, closer. Uh, the JCL uh, redress committee. I was really the co-chair, along with Phil Shigakuni, who was somewhere here. Here he is there. So Phil and I worked uh, diligently to recruit uh, potential witnesses, and it was uh, difficult because, as so Jim's already said, a lot of us were reluctant to appear before a commission. It was very intimidating. Here we were in a large auditorium, and the nine commissioners were on the platform looking down on the witness table, and there were Klieg lights flash, flashing, and there were the uh, flash bulbs from cameras and so on. So it's a very intimidating scene to ask people to testify before a federal commission. Many of these were Nisei, and the, the, the Nisei, I'm a Nisei, were reluctant to talk to their own kids about camp, much less appearing at a public forum. So it took a lot of courage, I think, to actually consent to agree to appear before the federal commission. And uh, so we, three months before the hearings themselves, we conducted training sessions. Uh, Phil and I worked with them at the Little Tokyo Towers. And uh, spent some time trying to alleviate their fears about appearing before the commission in public. And I was very pleased to see Peter Ota here and Peter was one of the, in the group, and we, uh, he was one of the persons we trained to help prepare to speak before the commission. We had mock hearings uh, for rehe and re rehearsals in preparation for our appearance. So I was very proud of our witnesses who appeared uh, and uh, who agreed to testify, some of them reluctantly, but they agreed to do it because of the importance of the event. And I can remember going to the um, hearings and the witnesses were very anxious and nervous, which I can understand. But they spoke, I think, very powerfully in an awesome manner. 
Uh, their hands were trembling, their voices cracked, and as you saw, some of them broke down in tears. So it was that they delivered a very powerful message, and I was glad to be part of the effort to uh, make an impact upon the commission, which I think we did. Let me just say this quickly. Um, I was, was the co-chair of the JCL committee. I was in regular contact with Bert Nakano. Bert was the lead person for redress for NCRR. And, I, and both of us felt it was very important for us, JCL and NCRR, to work together. And we were in total agreement, so we coordinated a lot of our efforts to witness, to uh, recruit witnesses, and, and we were in regular touch with each other to maximize our impact. Do, do you think the commission hearings helped to solidify that, that, kind, that relationship, or it was already in existence? You mean the relationship between, between NCR and JCL? Uh, at least here in Los Angeles. I hear there were some differences in other areas from, from what I hear from some people. But fortunately, uh, I think we had a decent relationship here in the LA area with NCRR and JACL. I think we really made it a point to work together. Um, I think the question about the commission hearings is who gets to testify? Whose voices do we hear here? And one, of course, are people who don't speak English that well, Japanese speaking. And I think, Evelyn, you were very instrumental in recruiting um, Japanese speaking um, uh, uh, Jap uh, people. So can you explain how you went about that? I, yeah, I did want to talk about that. So thank you very much. Um, one step backwards from that, though, is I remember that when the hearings, when we first heard the hearings were coming to LA, and it was, you know, again, a victory even to get it moved from DC to LA, um, it was still like a big emphasis on what they called experts, um, people who were like more highly educated, people who had uh, titles maybe before or after their names. And I think for NCRR, our attitude was that. It was the people, the regular people that you know Jim mentioned in his testimony. Those were the people that whose voices really needed to be heard, and a lot of those people at the time were Japanese-speaking people. You know, I don't we forget because most of those fo folks are gone now. But um, I remember I wanted to call one person's name out. She couldn't make it today because she had another commitment. But Yasuko Sakamoto, who was a social worker at Little Tokyo Service Center, but she. Um, sort of, you know, was born and raised in Japan, didn't experience camp herself, but I think because she worked with the Issei, the first generation folks, down to earth kind of folks, she really took it upon herself to make sure that the testimony of Japanese speaking people was part of the mix. And I know there was a big struggle. We had to push really hard to get uh, translation, the government to pay for translation, but finally they agreed to do that. and. I think that really opened up uh, a really important part of um, people's voices because, you know, if you think about it, it was really the Issei, the, that generation who were adults during mm -hmm. camp, and they're the ones, you know, their their experiences were really different. You know, they when you when you talk to them at that time, you didn't hear very many stories about. Well, I had a lot of fun at the dances because they were like adults who were trying to hold their families together by making that move and you know being incarcerated. So I think that voice was really important. I think again, Yasuko Sakamoto was really pivotal in providing and organizing and getting other people to get translations. Um, and eventually the government did provide translation to the people. And so it was part of the hearing. I, you know, it's really too bad because in the um, testimonies that we saw, none of the Japanese speaking people were in there because, you know, complicated, it would have required, I don't know, dubbing or, you know, um, um, subtitles and stuff. But I just wanted to say, I can't say enough how important that voice was because those were the adult people who were adults during the incarceration who had to hold their families together. You know, there were a number of women. Um, I was really shocked who lost children during childbirth in camp because they didn't have those facilities, you know? So I think that voice wouldn't have been 
expressed had it not been for people like Yasko and others, and, and, and NCRR, too, for really pushing to make sure that the, um, tr the um, testimonies were translated and that people could translate in their own uh, language, too. I'm just going to ask, in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask one question, and anyone could answer that, and then we're going to go into Q&A. So what are the, some of the lessons that we've learned from uh, both the commission hearings and the documentation of them? And I think, um, Harry, do you want to start us off? I think you had some thoughts. I think there were some uh, very meaningful consequences from the redress hearings that were conducted. Let me talk about a couple of them. I think we learned about the power of active, collective action. Uh, when the merits of redress were being considered, especially the monetary or non-monetary issue, I had some serious doubts about whether or not we would get uh, the agreement of the government to grant us a redress. And I had, as I said, it's very dubious of whether or not this would actually happen. The country was in a very uh, tight national budget. We had a very conservative president, Ronald Reagan, who said he was opposed to redress. So I was uh, not very optimistic about redress passing. But nevertheless, those of us in the Japanese American community pushed on and we contacted uh, a wider circle of supporters. We approached uh, the NAACP, ACLU, uh, Jewish groups, Latino groups, churches, uh, the American friends. So we're trying to rally the support of people to endorse and approve the uh, redress movement. And I think that through uh, a number of circumstances, uh, it, it incredibly worked out well. So in my judgment, the actual passing of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was truly a miracle. And I'm very thankful that it actually happened. What are other lessons? Oh, I, 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 yeah, another thing, I think that the uh, redress hearings mobilized more younger Japanese Americans and they got more interested and engaged in the political process by, go by being part of the redress effort. Uh, we picked up some political savvy, know-how, and so I think if you look at uh, the positions of people today, uh, Asian Americans, Japanese Americans, you see them at many different governmental levels. And I think that's a very positive result of, of the uh, redress hearings. And I think that was a very positive impact. I think about Al Muratsuchi in uh, Sacramento representing us. So he's uh, a one person who I think, uh, along hopefully with a lot of others, uh, who can make a political impact on governmental action. So I think that was a very positive outcome. Other, le Evelyn, you wanna uh, well, respond to that? <laughs> One thing, um, you know, how, how does it relate to today? Today, this morning, I'm sorry to go here, but um, this morning, you know, that um, bill was passed to uh, raise the taxes on most of us here in this room here. Um, that's not how it's touted, but that's how it's gonna be. And um, I heard that the group that's probably gonna be impacted immediately the most as a group are seniors because of the, what they call entitlements, you know, the Medicare and all that stuff. So, you know, it's really hard, um, you know, when, when we were doing, you know, building the redress campaign, we used to always say it was important, not just for ourselves, but also because um, of the future and of everybody in society. You know, it's gonna impact everything. And I think in a lot of ways, redress really impacted things in a positive way in general, made the society better. But um, 
I think that we always said um, it will never that it should never happen again. And I think we have to really take that to heart because right now, the kind of political leadership and the kind of things that are being said um, in terms of Muslims, in terms of you know uh, immigrants, is really outrageous and uncannily um, familiar. It sounds just like what was being said in those days about us. So I think it's really important for us to kind of take that part of it to heart, that lesson, that um, we can't let it happen to, again. We can't, because it happened to us. The impact of it was horrible. And um, we can't let another group of people suffer something like that again. And it Jim, any thoughts? I know, Jim, I've seen you at a lot of events speaking well, out. I'll, t I'll tell you, uh, NCR was, was and is a grassroots organization, and we learned an awful, an awful lot of how to communicate, how, who and uh, you don't just talk to anybody in general. You sort of target who you want to speak to, how to write letters, uh, how to fundraise, uh, how to do press conferences. Uh, we never knew how to do any of that. And we found out, uh, well, anyway, I found out <clears throat> early on that the, pr the press are very lazy. If, if you have a press conference in Long Beach, they don't want to come. That's a long way to go out there. So, of course, the closer you get to Hollywood, the easier it is for them. And they love coming to Little Tokyo because it's close, <laughs> right off the freeway, <laughs> you know? So, of course, uh, anytime we had something going on a press conference, we'd make sure we have it in Little Tokyo, or at one time we'd have it at the Hollywood Press Club. We knew how to write uh, press packets. We knew how to have little tidbits for them to eat. We knew how to have interesting speakers for them. And we got on TV so often, it was, it was pitiful, actually. <laughs> and so we learned all of that. Another lesson we learned, too, is that uh, you can't, um, <clears throat> you got to let leadership uh, come to the forefront uh, because we were, like I say, grassroots people. And a lot of our leadership were, were women. And they provided the, the strongest uh, leadership during the most crucial times. And I know because uh, anytime I got off base, I get a phone call from Lillian Nakano. <laughs> and she's saying, Jim, I know what you're saying, but don't you think we should hold that off until we pass this thing? And at the very end of it, I said, of course, you're right, Lillian. And so I call her the quarterback. So anyway, uh, the, it, it's, you've got to uh, let the people provide the leadership, and I think it works out for all of us. How about you, Dwayne, in terms of like just documentation and political mobilization? Um, actually, I'll just follow up with what Jim said because I think the most striking thing for me was just, uh, so I wasn't really confident that people were gonna be able to express their stories in front of the commission, but once people started talking, it just started coming out and I was just amazed at the courageousness, the, the the uh, detail and really the emotion that was behind the testimonies. And I, I can remember um, you know, be being behind the camera shooting some of these testimonies and cheering up and, and fighting to keep the camera you know, stable, et cetera. But the stuff that was coming out was just amazing. And uh, I was just so gratified to hear all of that. So I think the lesson is that people stepped up because they knew, they knew that they needed to. And uh, we just have that faith, I think, in our community. They can do that. So thank you, Sumi and Harry and Jim, for all stepping up. We, we really appreciate it. I know you all have questions. Um, so who has the cordless microphone? So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, Are the Japanese testimonies available in Japanese? Yeah. It is yeah. in Japanese on the? Subtitled. Oh, subtitled. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And by the way, I just wanted to, I don't think I thanked Julie Lee. Did I? I mean, it's like, so thank you so much. 
And Julie is the uh, artistic director of Kotofu, which is a, the, the oldest Asian American improv group. And she was my sensei, she was my teacher. So you're never too old to do improv. <laughs> and also I wanna give um, props to um, Steve Nagano who edited all of that, that we saw today, thank you. Another question. There's a hand, Guy Aoki has a question. I just wanna point out, uh, Daniel Lundgren was the person in charge of the commission, and he was the only commissioner who did not agree with the $20,000 reparations. And he fought so hard against it. You see the C-SPAN coverage, he was so much against it, tried to put all these amendments that would water it down. And then Duke Majin tried to make him state treasurer. And NCR went up there and testified against him, and Bob Matsui gave NCR credit because if it wasn't for NCRR, he would have been treasurer because he lost by like two votes. And then he tried to run for governor. And then Japanese Americans took out a full page ad in the Rafa and said, did you think we'd forget? And we went after him. So, so that's that for that as far as, as far as he's concerned. But I just want to point, I want to just thank Jim and all the people at NCR and JCL who got people to testify, who got the community from shame to outrage to being proud. Um, I was in the LA Times in 1988 when the bill was passed and my boss, David Kishiyama, he said, you know, when the commission hearings happened, he shook his head, he goes, the letters we got were overwhelmingly negative mm -hmm. against it. Like, you guys, it was for your own protection. It was, we couldn't trust you, all the, the BS that people were fed for decades. And by the time the bill was passed, he said, the overwhelming letters were positive for redress. So to turn around <clears throat> the community in less than a decade is really amazing on such a racially divisive issue. So I think people who help this, you really should be proud of yourselves. And, yeah. and I wish there had been a clip of Jim Matsuoka's response to Senator Hayakawa because he said the most outrageous things. I won't. Jim can fill you in, but Jim Matsuoka, you continue to be my hero. <laughs> uh, another thing um, that I found as a researcher, you could get the full transcripts of all the um, testimonies. At least I got it off of um, the Los Angeles mm. County Library. If you go on there, you can get it. If you have a library card, it's on not Los Angeles City, in Los Angeles County. And um, they, they have the full testimonies of every single person. And it's like you're reading a play, right? It's like incredible. OK, and another question. There's one, this gentleman here. Oh, there's two. We'll get to you. Well, in this day and age, I guess uh, if the hearings were going on today, everyone would have their cell phone out to uh, document uh, the hearings. But back then, it was really $400 is that like the total cost of <laughs> preserving this uh, major historical event? Yes, that was the cost of all the VHS tape to video this event with. But not the preservation of it, but just to record it, right? Yes, just the, record. the preservation, you know, because you, they're all old fo formats and you always have to update it, so. Okay, uh, NCRR and VC, and they're not really into money, so I don't know if they, <laughs> they have the figures right at their fingertips, but. Yeah. This is Kathy Masaoka, why don't you? Well, uh, we've had three different preservation teams and times that we've done this, so the first one was under John when he was at VC and we had a grant from the federal um, grant program. Second time, I think Visual Communications had another round of uh, digitizing and also the subtitling of the Japanese um, testifiers. And then this time we're doing, now we're prepared that people can actually buy the, the DVDs. Uh, and that was about 10 or 12,000. But total, I don't know, John, do you know anything about the first one and the second one? 40,000. Okay, 40. So 40,000, so maybe 50, 60,000 to actually do all this. Okay. 
And I just want to say one thing since I have the mic. And that, <laughs> that is that, um, you know, uh, Dwayne Kubo took the 23 hours of tape and quickly, quickly edited the highlights uh, into an hour and a half tape that we were able to take out. And I want to say this because it's kind of important that it wasn't just the hearings. I mean, it impacted so many of us that were there. But the hearings also helped in the redress campaign because that video was taken out on the road to colleges and churches and community groups. Uh, so many that first and second year of outreach. And uh, that was such a valuable resource that people could learn about the experiences through those videotapes. Otherwise, they would have had people having to come and speak, and they weren't quite ready to do that all the time. But many Nisei did join those teams of speakers. So that was really important. Hi, yeah, in the video, I don't think I saw any faces of the commissioners. Uh, was that on purpose? Were you told not to show their faces? Or was that for economical reasons? Uh, actually, there were shots of the commissioners in the video. But um, <clears throat> I think we just saw a short clip. Uh, there are times when the commissioners respond to the uh, testimonies. Hello, thank you so much, panelists. This is really um, a very amazing for me experience to witness this. Uh, one of the panelists, I believe it was Harry, mentioned the inter-ethnic coalitions that formed or the, the outreach that was made uh, um, to garner some support from other ethnic communities. Can you mention some of the groups, African-American or Latino or Mexican-American or La Raza groups that you reached out to? Or maybe Evelyn, do you have any recollections? I, I do remember. Um, there was one testimony by a gentleman named Gilbert Sanchez. Many people here know him. And he was active in the Chicano Latino community. He was uh, involved in the union movement. And I, I remember that his testimony was very moving, too, because um, he talked about you know, where he lived growing up with a lot of different people, including Japanese Americans, and how many people got taken away during the war. So I, I remember him in particular. I don't remember organizations. I think there was. I think there was this Comité de la Raza. That's right, Comité de la Raza. Yeah. Any African American groups you recall at the time? There was that group. There was a group that was formed to push for uh, African American redress. I remember that we met with a few times, but um, nothing really developed out of that. I mean. You know, they were very supportive. We were supportive to them, but. I'm supposed to be working uh, the microphone, mm -hmm. so I'll speak. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I wanted to add that um, during the commission, I'm sorry, after the commission hearings and during the campaigning, the uh, Black Congressional Caucus was one of the first Two. caucuses to come on board and support us. And one of the most like uh, memorable testimonies in favor of redress was from Ron Dellums from Oakland. We watched that over and over because it was just really heartfelt, very emotional, powerful. But also all the different church, national church organizations came forward and supported redress, like the Lutheran Synod. And well, there were quite a few. Labor came out, AFL-CIO, teachers unions. Um, really very, very diverse support. It was wonderful. Thank you, that's K-O-G. Just, just to add to that, you know, I think um, thinking about it, because I can't remember anything nowadays, but um, <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, I do remember one thing. Um, there was a bill that was previous to the redress bill that passed, and it was introduced by Mervyn Dimely, who is a real strong and consistent supporter of redress. And he was an elected official who's African American in the 31st district, I believe. Yes. Oh, well, on, on that point briefly, I remember, I think one of the commissioners was the retired Senator Ed Brooke, Republican. I think he was the first African-American senator since Reconstruction. But the question, I, I was hoping the panelists could help refresh my recollection on something. Um, I remember that there was a, a hearing in the dining room of Little Tokyo Towers that, that had not e been scheduled. The one evening hearing. Yeah. yeah, and I think I saw 
part of, excerpt from that on the video. And I was wondering if, if it, some of you could talk about how that hearing came to be, because I don't remember it being originally scheduled. So it, it's a great thing if that hearing at Little Tokyo Towers has been preserved. I think it, it was a great thing that it was preserved. And um, what I remember, and you know, Kathy should actually add, she should be up here too, but um, I, I remember that there were only daytime hearings initially. You know, not only was the emphasis on experts that changed, but the, you know, during the day, that was the only time the hearings, so that mean, meant that people had to take off work. So we pushed really hard to get an evening hearing so that working people who couldn't get off of work could participate and come. And I think two things I remember from that hearing, one was, um, well, it was really great it was at the Towers because a lot of the seniors who lived there could come down to the hearing, down, they just had to come downstairs. But the other thing was, um, I remember, um, I think there's a little clip of it, but uh, there was a writer named, I believe his name was Bill Shinkai. Mm -hmm. And his quote was kind of uh, cut off a little bit, but it really struck me because he talked about, um, you know, we, you talk about the camps being over and people leaving camp in 1944, 45, but really we've never really gotten out of camp and we're just starting to now after the hearings, you know, after people spoke out and testified and stuff. And I remember that was really, um, uh, really mo a moving thing, and it really ca encapsulated in a lot of ways the impact of the hearings. Um, yeah, I'm wondering what are your plans? You had mentioned that it was about $50,000 or perhaps $60,000 to get it this far. And has all that money been raised, and are you fine with that? Because it seems I'm just wondering, what are the plans for putting this information out further? Now we have YouTube, now there are ways of renting a movie instead of having to buy it, and, and, and through the internet it's more easily distributable. So are there any, um, what are your thoughts? <laughs> because it should be more widely seen. Um, I just you. wanted to briefly mention um, what's available right now. Uh, the NCR Education Committee, and that includes Steve Nagano, Patty Nagano, Kathy Masoka, Susie Katsuda, and Janice Yen, they have been working and they've created a single DVD compilation tape, uh, well, compilation that's available today for your purchase, so a little bit of a money thing. And it also has a menu. Um, and that's going to be on sale today in the lobby for $25. So I know that wasn't quite your question, but I just wanted to mention that right now. And there's also now a full set um, that's available um, for institutions and individuals at a reduced rate of $250. But Kathy, why don't you come up here and just, um, in terms of her question about like getting it out and Dwayne, if you want to comment too, like in terms of like stream, are there any discussions about streaming or you know, um, I don't, editing it for a broadcast, um, anything like that? Well, I know that Dwayne actually, and I think Steve Nagato, uh, you know, uh, people have expressed interest in these tapes over the years and. Recently, San Francisco asked uh, about showing it at their Day of Remembrance. So we have, I know Steve has worked on various short uh, eight minute, 11 minute, and now this is another one, um, uh, clips that can be shown at various you know, events or, or programs. So that's one thing. We, we're not, I don't know if we have the capabilities of streaming or, doing, or being able to uh, do that. We need help with that. We're we're kind of old, and we're not. I mean, I'm. I don't have those skills. I don't know if Steve does, but you know, <laughs> you know, we we need people who can help us do that. Uh, but I think that really, I think there's quite a bit of interest in in the tapes, and I know that Chicago had a uh, an exhibit there recently, and apparently there were tapes of the Chicago hearings, but in very very poor condition, or. It was even the original may have been thrown away. So, there, yeah, people are trying to dig these things up now. So it's 
you know, we're also, I think we're very open and willing to uh, talk to people about ways that it can get out to other places. But for right now, the, the single DVD with uh, about 22 testimonies uh, is, is available, and you can order the 23 hours if you want all of it. Dwayne, anything? I mean, you have this YouTube channel, right? <laughs> I do, but uh, so I guess you guys know I don't live in LA, so I'm not really in on the planning process. <laughs> Although I would really encourage NCRR and VC to think about putting it online somewhere. I have to say, as a consumer, I get so much out of the de uh, the Den Show interviews. I mean, to have that kind of stuff online now is just amazing. So to have this online would just really benefit, I think, certainly Asian American studies. Oh, sounds good. Yeah. I'm sure Steve can do it. <laughs> can I, excuse me, can I add um, a possible suggestion? Oh, yes. Uh, okay, yeah. Over yeah. Here. Uh, if you wouldn't, or if you could consider GoFundMe or one of those sorts of sites where we would say for more than $25, you'd give us a copy, but you'd be, uh, we could actually send out copies more easily and get it to streaming um, perhaps in a quicker way that way? It's, it's just one thought. Um, so a crowdfunding. Well, one thing, um, and I want to kind of wrap this up because we could have these individual discussions um, in the lobby. Um, but NCRR, uh, I, I think you're always looking for volunteers, right? to help with these kind of things? Are you open to newcomers to come in who, who want to be? Over, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, th these people have been like volunteering their time all these years. So I think, I think it's great to have ideas, but it's like, well, who's going to kind of implement them? So any, any comments about that, Kathy? Hmm. <laughs> Well, no, seriously, we are kind of waning. You know, as I said, we are getting older. And, um, you know, we, we want to see these things happen, and we can do it to a limited extent. But we don't really have, one, the skills, two, maybe the energy and ability to learn those skills, although we want to learn some of them. So we really need people that can help kind of lead that a little more. So if you're willing to do that, please come and talk to any of us on the committee. In closing, does anyone want to say anything? S Sumi, I'm sorry I didn't get to ask you that many questions. You want to say anything in closing today? <laughs> You're, you've all talked down. <laughs> anyone else here on the panel as we close? I think there's a clip of Yuji Ichioka's uh, testimony. Maybe could we, we could end with that. And we'll end with that and then I think there, I hope there's food. I hope there's arare <laughs> as part of, and, and what, oh, one thing I failed to do, I'm failing to do a lot of things. I wanted people who actually testify to raise their hands. Great. And then, <laughs> after we see the UG clip, can you come down? We want to take a picture with you, you all in it. And number two, who attended the hearings? Who, okay. What? Who, at, who attended the hearings? <laughs> and then last of all, who are, who are related to a person who's not around today but testified? Okay, great. So thank you all and we'll end on Yuji's note. And please, those who testified, please come down. And everybody, get your arare out there. There's also a lot of um, flyers and things, because this is all about um, community empowerment. So there's a lot of different um, things you might want to get involved in, and those um, resources out, out there as well. Do I need to say anything else, Kathy? OK, so here's Yuji. <laughs> I'd like to talk about what I find significant about the hearing. At the beginning, when I heard about the hearings, I said, the hell with it. I dismissed it <clears throat> with contempt. 
I changed my mind because I heard what the Niseis were saying. <clears throat> and that affected me very, very personally. But the Niseis and the Issays and the Sanseis, the few Issays, have given their testimony. It's unembellished, it's straightforward, and it's a devastating indictment of our government and of our society. To me, it's a collective catharsis. It's a kind of rite of passage. We've had it. We've shown too much respect, too much deference for too long. That's over now, from here on out. We will not govern no more. But we have been victimized, but that we have endured. If adversity is the true test of character, then we Japanese Americans have passed the acid test. We have demonstrated <clears throat> that we are dogged, resilient, and yes, while being modest, a courageous people. Yes, we have been quiet, otomashi, but not anymore. We have become the opposite, yakamashi. 